Welcome to a special edition of Conversations with CASA. This edition focuses on the impact of the coronavirus and how the CASA network is responding locally and statewide. My name is Vicki Spriggs and I'm, your, I'm the CEO of Texas CASA and your host for today's show. And my guest today is Ben Wilkins, who is the Chief Program Officer of Dallas County CASA. And I believe Dallas County CASA is the oldest CASA program in Texas. Am I correct with that? Yes, you are. I thought so. Okay. So we know that the coronavirus has created an environment that requires people to, one, socially distance, and two, more importantly, not have students in school, not have guests coming into a household and with the CASA role being so much of connection, 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 can you tell us how the COVID virus has um, impacted volunteer services and how have they been able to continue working with children and families? Sure, well, like many counties, we're, at a, we're under a stay at home order. Uh, this has completely changed the nature of what we do, and it has caused us to turn to technology. Uh, we've turned to virtual visits, so the preference is video conferencing, and if not, some other ways such as phone. We've increased the frequency of visits, and in most cases, we're doing those weekly now, since we can't be face-to-face. -face. Once we started using the technology, though, one of the biggest questions was what happens after hello, because we weren't used to conducting our visits by phone. And so volunteers have been very creative. They have been um, helping kids with their homework. They've been reading stories, drawing pictures, playing games, and generally just doing things to keep up that level of interaction so that those visits are very meaningful and we maintain that rapport. Uh, technology has also played a big role in how we're working in the court systems. Dallas CASA is in 10 different courts, and each of those courts has been carrying out uh, court hearings via Zoom or Microsoft Teams. And so we've had to learn that software and we've had to, you know, learn how to take part in that environment. So we're still going to court. We're also going to permanency conferences. We're attending mediation. Uh, you know, we are very uh, actively involved in the collaborative family engagement model developed by Texas CASA, and so we're continuing to have those. Our CFE coordinator, uh, Kim Higgins, is holding a variety of meetings. We even have a family meeting coming up. So even though we're social distancing, we're still carrying out that important advocacy and finding ways to move permanency along. Super. Thank you. So it really shows the adaptability and flexibility of the network, which really demonstrates the commitment that CASA programs in Dallas County be an, ex an example of that, that CASA programs have to servicing children and families and maintaining that sense of urgency and connection. Absolutely. Yeah, and I love that. It's almost the title of an article. What happens after you say hello? You can have the copyright, yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so we know this is Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness Month. And this is the month that many CASA programs would host their-, their yes. uh, and awareness events. Um, were you all able to hold your, your, your fundraiser? And if not, um, what does that mean for your program? Well, we had two events that were fundraising events scheduled for this month, and those were canceled. Uh, I think many programs, like you said, did have events uh, scheduled for April. I think the headline for the network so far has been that funders and supporters of all kinds have recognized the unique situation that we're in and have uh, worked hard to make sure we have options to get the funds we need to do, uh, that we need to do our job. Uh, event revenue, I think going forward is something that concerns programs all across the network. If uh, programs had capital campaigns underway or if they were adding positions for growth, those are things that people are having to look at. Uh, my hope is that anyone watching this video if you're uh, in the position to be able to help or support a CASA program, please know that now more than ever, we need your support to keep doing the work we do. Absolutely, absolutely, thank you. And I know it seemed like I asked that question out of, um, it's, it's not a natural follow-up to what we were talking about before about adapting, but it impacts adapting, right? Um, and in terms of impacting adapting, and uh, you know, you, what you've just said is because programs aren't able to go forward with their fundraising events, it does impact the level of service they're able to provide um, in the future going forward. Um, and along that line, 
can we talk about the biggest gap to see that there might need to that might need to be addressed for assisting children and families, um, and, and how this is playing out during this virus at this at the local level? What do you see? Sure. So two things come to mind. The biggest gap that we've seen is the technology gap related to education. School is at home, school is online. Some of our kinship care provider or relative care providers who struggle financially are struggling more now than ever, and they may not have the devices, and sometimes the school hasn't been able to provide those. I heard a couple days ago of two kids who were having to do all their schoolwork on their caregiver's phone, right? Uh, so this has been an area where CASA advocacy has played a big role. We've helped families find services that were available for the school. We've helped connect them to free um, subscription services. We've procured a variety of sort of donated devices. One of our family foundations has stepped up and provided some funding uh, for us for that. We've helped people implement these tools. So it, that's been an area where our ability to make a difference with advocacy has actually increased because of COVID-19, because the, the needs are very different. Another gap uh, that we've seen has been food insecurity, because some of our caregivers have lost income or had their income reduced because of COVID-19, because businesses are closed or because they're being furloughed. And there are a variety of resources that are in all the communities across the state. In Dallas, we've been privileged to be part of a program that's coordinated by our governor's office called Comfort Care Food Packages, where people using a meal delivery service can donate an extra meal for kinship care providers. Uh, I wanted to give a shout out to my coworkers, Christy Dixon, Catherine Laza, and Chad Frommeyer, who spent many hours on this. Uh, and I'm aware that across the network that many local programs are finding resources in the community and helping just make sure that the families where their kids are living are, are being able to eat. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. It's, um, yeah, I think that the, um, the impact of this virus is so multi-leveled that we are, we are to the child welfare family aspect of it um, and keeping families whole and intact and the stress that's on them right now. Um, but there are, I'm sure there are factors that are going to show up in coming years that we haven't even contemplated yeah. right now that aren't visible. Um, you touched on something that um, I'd like to just ask you a little bit more about. Uh, we know the CASA network is resilient. In fact, I uh, am resourceful. I also want to say that. Um, you referenced how your program, your volunteers, and your staff are, are reaching out and connecting people to resources. Um, and I think that's important. And I want to ref uh, I want to make note of the fact that Texas CASA on our website has a list of resources yes. in the well, our COVID-19 resources site, if anyone goes to texascasa.org. I want to mention that, but I also want to ask you, um, what else have you seen that's inspired you over the last two months? What has inspired me most is the creative problem solving that I've seen, that people are faced with these, this very novel situation with these very important demands, and they're finding creative ways I've also been impressed by people's continued commitment to the mission and by the way that people are just staying connected to each other. People have done some really innovative ways. We have teams that are having a Zoom lunch together or taking a Zoom walk together and taking extra care to make sure that that person that you, you're not seeing right now is feeling connected and supportive. Uh, this has been very challenging. I think it's also brought out the best in people and the best in the network. And so I've been grateful for that. It's helped keep me going. Super. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And I, and, and I just want to say to any viewer uh, who is a CASA volunteer, thank you yes. for the work you've done to fill in that gap and to maintain that consistency with that child and family during the course of this, um, it, uh, I keep calling it isolation. Um, what's the proper word? It's the, the stay at home order, if you will. So I want to thank the volunteers and the staff of the CASA Network for, yes, the creativity that you talked about, the resiliency that you talked about, the resourcefulness that you've talked about. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that we, we are anticipating a 
spike or a significant increase in calls to the child abuse hotline when we come out of these shelter in place orders. Um, because what we saw with calls going into the child abuse hotline at the beginning of March, we saw more than 11,000 calls, I think, at the start of March. By the end of March, when children were out of school and not being seen, we saw that number decrease to less than 3,000. And so we're expecting there to be a spike once, once the shelter in place orders are done and people are seeing what's happening. And so we ask during Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness Month that people pay attention to their neighbors and be as supportive as they can if they've got a child there to help reduce that stress and perhaps provide some respite during the course of a day. Um, but then that other piece is we know that the need for volunteers will be ever present. And so I would ask, is Dallas CASA, because you're reflective of other programs, which is why we're talking to you today, um, is Dallas CASA continuing to recruit? If so, how? And what's been the success with that? You know, that has been uh, one of the silver linings to this, is that people are still calling us. They still want to get involved. Uh, as you said, we do anticipate that um, the need is greater and that when mandated reporters and more kind of in-person uh, interaction resumes that you're going to see a lot of referrals. But even now, children are still coming into care. They still need CASA volunteers. So we're still recruiting. We're, uh, we're still holding information sessions. We're still taking applications. We are interviewing and we are training. We just wrapped up a training class that had started in person uh, and we finished it with Zoom. And in the meantime, uh, implemented a learning management system so that we can train online uh, in a really robust way going forward. We have our very first online swearing in ceremony coming up on May 1st and are very excited about that. So the need is there and the opportunity is there. And I think um, in talking with some uh, people who work at other programs that across the board people are seeing that the interest in volunteering is still very high. So my message to anyone watching this is if you're thinking about getting involved, get involved. The need is there and we can make it work. Super. Thank you for that. Thank you. And thank you for being our guest today. My pleasure. Oh, yeah. Thank you. You know, that's, it's the time delay of virtual reality. Um, so forgive me for stepping on your communications, but I sure do appreciate you being with us today. And I appreciate the information that you shared and the spirit with which you shared it. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this special edition of Conversations with CASA. We'll see you next time.